Hi, Pete. You okay, mate? Hi. Yeah, good, good, good. I'll get I'll get on with it because I know I've only got a short time with you, which is quite which I'm glad you know I'm glad I've got to speak to you. Um, I've had a look at the new album. Um, I'm glad to see I can see that sweet harmony is the first track on there. Um, the beloved. Right. Um, that takes me back. Yeah. I mean, how did you go about selecting the tracks? Because you could have selected a million records, you know. But how did you go about selecting the, the tracks for the new album? Um. Well, I mean, obviously now we've been. You know, our heads have been, my head's been into this for like four, four and a half years. Yeah. Um, the list at the beginning was always really, really long mm. and we, we could never perform or record all the songs, um, for, from the beginning, you know, and, you know, and yeah. obviously you just, you know, part, partly it's working through the list, you yeah. know, and, um, partly it's getting more confident about the way we were doing things and, and getting to know the process. I've learned an awful lot. I've been around, you know, recording studios and, you know, making records and working with artists all my life. But yeah, yeah. working with an orchestra on this scale and working with Jules Buckley and as an arranger, mm. um, orchestrator and working with people like Mark Ralph and Fraser T, yeah. you know, you get more, um, you get more ideas just by sitting with them and going through the process of making these records. So I think, mm. Sweet Harmony was very high on the list for the third album. Mm. If, if, if we could um, come up with the right singer. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, initially there was an idea of doing it as a duet for a long time, um, we, but we ended up with Nina and we just thought she's... She, and, and, and we kind of promoted Brendan from the from the orchestra as like, like the lower male, male voice on that track. Mm. And that's the way it ended out. I mean, that's funny enough. I'm really pleased with the way it came out. Mm. Um you know, we thought about adapt, you know, adapting it even more radically and kind of doing it without a beat. But in the mm. end, we um, we just kind of modernised the beat and, and left it like that. So, I mean, was it always at the back of your mind then this selection of tracks? Because I know, like you say, you've been doing this for like four and a half I mean, years. Sun, now. I mean, funny enough, Sunrising was. I'll give you something. Sun, Sunrising was a track we were going to do by the beloved back from back in the day. Yeah, yeah. But actually, through through playing in the in the actual arenas and mm. being on tour with the orchestra, mm. um, Sweet Harmony kind of came to the fore because you kind of, I can kind of, I can kind of, I could visualize playing that live in, yeah. and it being a bigger moment in the show. So a lot of the choices, to be honest, are always with the show in mind as well. Ah, yeah. Cause I, I, I presume with this album then, yeah, obviously with the, the foresight was because of like, say, being at, at Cafe Del Mar, seeing the sun rising. And like you say, the first track would have been perfect to have the sun rising but because like you just said having playing yeah. it in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in an arena or whatever probably Sweet Harmony does sort of yeah yeah well it's, it's more the euphoria of that everyone's singing together mm. um, that's mm. kind of where that that kind of um, idea came from on Sweet Harmony so yeah. I mean, you've also got every heartbeat on there. Robin's classic track, haven't you on there? Um, and you got Simon Larson singing. Yeah, I mean, that was that, that. I mean, that's a song I actually remixed back in the day with um, my mate Dave Spoon. Oh, okay. You know, called Shadow Child, but um, oh, I did this mix that like everybody's always raved about, and we actually had this like little orchestral break in the middle. So I mm. always. Again, that song was like, I was, I was definitely going to get around to do that song, but, and I wanted to do it as a ballad. Yeah. Not, you know, and, and, and it was kind of the, it was the reason the album ended up being called Chill Classics, really, because that was the focus song. And mm. then, um, mm. the idea of getting, you know, Robin's protege, you know, the, the you know, from a different generation, Zara Larson, to sing yeah. her idol song, mm. um, you know, and do it as a kind of Cafe Del Mar, you know, Cafe Mambo Sunset kind of moment. That was yeah. that was the vision. I'm, I'm really super pleased with the way it turned out. So. Yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to that. You've also got um, one of Nick Chicane's Offshore on there as well, which is the epitome yeah. of, of the classic sort of Ibiza track for yeah, me. Yeah, well, I mean, funny enough with that one, we actually have been performing that for a while. Mm. Um, so we managed to actually come up with an arrangement and um, mm. I mean we've been working on this album for a while so we kind of recorded that um, okay. last year mm. up front of the rest of the album and we actually started performing that on the tour last year and it it, 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 it really it, it's a great moment so 
And, and also with with yourself, I know that you you must like the creative freedom and control that performer with an orchestra must give you. Then, because like you say, you've you've you, you, you can sort of vision visualize, I guess, what would work and what wouldn't work in an arena with an orchestra. Well, I think I've definitely got experience. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, um, I mean, it's a funny thing you say freedom. I mean, yeah, I mean, creative freedom. I mean, once you're with an, I mean, I can't chop and change things like I would when I'm a DJ, but, mm. um, we've obviously got, a, we've built up a big catalogue of tracks now to, to, to work, work on. So we chop and change, you know, every year the show evolves and, yeah. um, even yeah. show by show, depending on the room we're in, depending on the guests we've got traveling with us, depending on the reaction of the crowd the night before, we some, we'd, we'd sometimes make changes on the day as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the show that will, um, you know, the show that um, will come to Cardiff or, you know, yeah, will be, be different yeah. from any, for anything we did when we went to um, Cardiff Castle. Ah, uh, right. I was going to ask you about that. How is it yeah, going to yeah. differ? Because that was yeah. obviously open uh, outdoors. I mean, how was it? Last year. Yeah, how is it going to differ then with the indoor? I know it's obviously a different setting completely. I mean, how have you adapted to well, that? Actually, it's a different... Um, well, Carter kind of Castle was one of the greatest shows. I mean, I love that, that tour where we went and played. Mm. Like, we did a couple of castles, actually. Mm. So mm. That was the summer of 18. Mm. Um, so, obviously, that's that just added a... You know, when we go to an arena, it's more about our visuals and, and all that stuff and the lights. But when we went, you know, you go to, like, iconic settings like that, it just mm. adds another dimension. So that was a really um, thrilling, you know, day to, to do that. And um, But the, I mean, yeah, the, it's, um, the show's going to be um, quite different from that one. I mean, it's got, it's got a different opening. It's got a, um, it's got a lot of different content during it. But hopefully the crowd will enjoy it oh, as much. <laughs> We will, we will, we all be there. Don't Funny we? when you do this, you're, 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 you're kind of because it's become so popular. Mm. It's you're always, you know, fifty percent of the audience just want to see the same thing again, and fifty percent of the audience want to see you again, but they don't want to see the same songs. So it's like yeah. um, constantly fighting that battle. It, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a, I guess it's a fine balance, doesn't it? You've got to sort of please the, the, the oldies and please the newbies, you know, and uh, it's just, it, you, it must be quite tricky for you and Jules to sort of, you know, work that magic, I guess. Well, no, I mean, what, um, well, actually, no, once we get up there, I mean, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a great crew. We, we enjoy being mm. on the road each other's company and we don't I mean relatively speaking we don't get to do it that often I mean I don't get to see Jules um, pretty much any time apart from when I'm with him to okay. do this or, or to make the records mm. so we enjoy each other's company we, he's a busy guy I'm a busy guy mm. um, and it's great when we get back together it's like it is like now it's like getting the, the team back together so it's mm. got that kind of camaraderie about it and a lot of the although the Heritage Orchestra is vast and that mm. Mm. Um, quite a lot of the players change the core the core team never changes the core band never changes so it's always good to get to back together with everyone yeah. i mean what sort of you know rehearsals do you put into something like this these sort of shows because i know are you still in america are you still in l.a i'm in america no they i mean with a lot of the work's being done behind the scenes i i like the chain like we've been through this 18 month process of making the album so yeah okay i've been daily involved, you know, working from home or like yeah. liaising with people working in London or going backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. um, Jules does a lot of his orchestration um, in, his, in his own space and then we get to, like physically get together when you record the orchestra. But I mean, funny enough, it's, um, it's a bit, there's a lot of work for Jules before the, before the show and quite a lot of work for the band, but the yeah. orchestra is, um, it's a bit freaky actually. It's, um, they're just so good, they don't actually need that much time. And that worries, that worries the hell out of me, because I always think we should have more. But um, what you think is going to take a week in yeah. rehearsal, actually they can bang out in like a day, a day and a half. Jesus. And, and it's an amazing thing, because they run, they run so tight to the clock. Yeah. Um, and, but they, they're, they're such great players, they just don't, they just look at the music on the sheets of paper and it, they, they play it. They play the right notes in the right order in the right time. Yeah, yeah. So, and they get knocked into shape pretty quickly by Jules if they're out on any of that. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> that bit's quite miraculous. You know, I, I just had that conversation two days ago. It's like, we haven't got enough rehearsal time. 
saying we're trying to do all these changes. It's like, don't worry, don't worry, it'll be all right on the night. <laughs> I know, but thanks for technology. When we do, yeah. And you, and you can thanks for the awesome technology these days. You can be do it by FaceTime or by you know video call, can't you? I guess it's pretty. Well, not cool. with an orchestra, no. You do oh, actually together, but um, yeah. Yeah. What 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 would you say the success is, and why has it been such a success that Pete Tongs presents? I mean, is it mainly due to the older audiences now having grown up wanting to sort of relive their youth? I guess or. Or what do you think it is because rather well, than having to go to a sweaty club full of millennials? I think, I think, it's, a, I think, it's, a, I think it's a number of things. I think mm. it's definitely that. I think it's, um, <coughs> you know, it's in the, the generation that was clubbing in um, the 90s, you know, early 2000s, they don't want to, you know, they might have been 20, 25 then, and now they're 40. Yeah. So that doesn't mean they, they're not old, you know, they want, they still, they just got, more responsibilities and families. Yeah, they still yeah. love the music, and that music shaped a very a crucial part of their lives. So mm. I think that was a big success. Yeah, getting that audience out mm. Um, mm. again to come and see something like this in a, in a you know they don't have to stay up in a club <laughs> at night till yeah. six in the morning anymore. Yeah. Um, I think also just the idea of like if you are into clubbing and you are into following DJs around and all that stuff, then then this is refreshing way to see your favourite music so I think that was another aspect of the, um, mm. the success of the show mm. and I think although the biggest secret weapon of the show I think is that once you've seen one of these shows and you've been in the room with 10,000 people or 18,000 people at the O2 mm. it, it creates a, a, something you can't bottle <laughs> yeah, yeah. you just want it you know, and you want to do it again so we get a lot of repeat customers just want to be yeah. in the midst of this euphoria again of like there's something magical it's like going to a football match when everyone sings you know you'd never walk alone or your favorite football song yeah it's just being in a huge crowd of like-minded people you know s celebrating or enjoying this music so i think that's that's probably i would say the number one reason we're still out there doing mm. it <laughs> yeah no cause i i did one recently with judge jewels he did the ministry of sound one and you're in the audience and it's just like say the euphoricness have been there but you mix you're standing yeah. next to like a 65 year old man who's you know dancing his head off you know but yeah. just having a drink yeah. and this is seven o'clock in the evening not what 12 o'clock at night you know like seven o'clock where yeah. it's just surreal it's a surreal experience yeah. um for you for yourself the other, success, the other success of it by the way is the fact that like people can't get enough of it and hence we've got like a lot of people kind of mm. basically done their own version of what we've been doing so um that's that's a testament to the success of it there's so yeah. many um kind of copycat uh versions of the, of the original idea so yeah you you you're the original idea so the better one <laughs> but it's just um one last one i mean you once said that dance music has always had a chip on its shoulder do you still feel that way Um, a little bit, a little bit. Some of it's self-deserved. <laughs> hmm. I think it's it. I, di I just think it's constantly um, a fight to get our music and our scene taken seriously by the um, you know the mainstream. You know the you know the mainstream establishment yeah. that would judge what music's good and what music's not good you know so I yeah. think dance music always seems I mean we've had our moments over the years you know when it seems like you're the biggest thing on the planet mm -hmm. in terms of a youth culture movement but in ge in general um, you know it's still it's still music made by DJs and producers it's slightly faceless mm -hmm. so it's a disadvantage there that you, you can't it doesn't manifest itself on stage with Ed Sheeran and a guitar or do a lipper you know yeah <laughs> And it gives it credibility as well. That's kind of where the chip on the shoulder came from. Right, okay. okay. Right, nice one, Pete. But it's been lovely speaking to you. Now. Right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Right, mate. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Right.